welcome to our 22nd episode of Join Us at the Table. I'm Brian. And I'm Cameron. And today we are so excited to have Brian Caitlin with us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Brian is an author, producer, and the co-founder of the Reducitarian Foundation. Today, we are excited to chat with him about his foundation, his documentary, Meet Me Halfway, and his recently released book of the same title. His goal is to help people reduce their food intake of their animal-based food intake in consideration to their personal health, animal health, and the health of our planet. So we are so happy to welcome you to join us at the table. Could you start by telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you became interested in the food sustainability space? Yeah, thanks again for having me. Oh gosh, it's always those reflecting on our origin stories here. Um, well, you know, for me, I grew up in Staten Island, New York. And for folks who are familiar with Staten Island, they will not think of it as a particularly progressive place in terms of food, um, and particularly in, in terms of plant-based cuisine or something like that. But growing up, I spent a lot of time in nature. Uh, Staten Island's a very green borough. And I kind of became your typical environmentalist. I cared a lot about the nature um, and also the animals that were living in those environments. And so by the time I got to college, I was kind of your typical environmentalist. I would tell people they should recycle and compost and walk to school instead of drive and so on. And later in college, I read a book called The Ethics of What We Eat by Peter Singer and Jim Mason. I was actually on a plane eating a hamburger at the time and a friend of mine gave me the book and I read it on the flight. And that was a real eye opener for me because I just didn't know that raising animals for food was such a resource intensive process. Um, the vast majority of animals are raised in, in something called um, factory farms um, or confined animal feeding um, operations, CAFOs. Um, very resource intensive in terms of water usage, uh, clearing of land, having to feed those animals um, on lots of feed. Uh, and then of of course, the, the treatment of these animals being very cruel, confined in, in cages and small conditions, not seeing um, light, um, denied basic um, rights. Um, and then from a health perspective, you know, I grew up in Staten Island, a lot of McDonald's and Burger King and Popeyes and Baskin Robbins and on and on, and just a lot of people eating a lot of junk food with meat at its center. And so when I learned about all that, I decided that I wanted to be vegetarian on my way to being vegan. For the most part, that was really great, but there were kind of particular social situations where I found myself sort of falling off the, the tofu train, as they say. Um, there was one Thanksgiving, for example, where I kind of took a piece of turkey, and put it in my mouth under some pressure from my family to partake in the festivities that is Thanksgiving. And my sister said, I thought you were a vegetarian, Brian. She was kind of calling me out. And I remember really not having the words to describe how I felt, but I was kind of irked because I was with people who were like the average American who were eating well over 200 pounds of meat a year. I was probably having a couple of pounds of meat a year. And that didn't make a lot of sense because if we can get um, a lot of people to cut back by a small percentage, it's gonna make a much greater difference than getting a small number of, of highly committed people to go vegetarian or vegan. And quite frankly, most people I do in, in that island and, and in the greater world are very unlikely to go vegetarian or vegan. So, you know, to make a long story short, in collaboration with a, a friend of mine, Tyler, we realized that there was a need for a more moderate message, something that the average person could do, uh, which is how we came up with the word reducitarian. A reducitarian is someone who's decided to cut back on the amount of animal products that they consume. And the idea is that if we get a lot of people to make some small changes to their diet, say we could reduce societal consumption of meat by 10% or 20%, it's gonna make a huge difference in terms of water usage and greenhouse gas emissions and, and land use, sparing you know, millions, of, if not billions of animals from a lifetime of suffering, and maybe even improving people's health if they switch from eating meat to having more fruits and vegetables in their diet. So I'm sure we'll get more into this, but that's kind of how this all started for me um, and how Reducitarian was born. Definitely. And I know you kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, have you, do you have any data on like current impact you would see from a Reducitarian diet or kind of what this movement would look like? Um, also, I know it's probably a little bit newer, so data might not be kind of there yet, but, or what you think it might look like too, kind of going forward in practice. 
Yeah, there, there's certainly data, you know, well, you look at articles, or you read research papers on what happens when a person goes vegetarian or vegan, for example, it really the same principle applies, you're just maybe cutting, you know, the, the amount of impact down by a, a half or, or more, for example. So you can imagine, I mean, let's just start with there's 70 billion land animals that are slaughtered annually, um, worldwide. Um, in the United States, it's about 9 billion land animals. Sea, sea animals, fish, it's in the trillions. So let's just ignore that for a second. And you can imagine that if we could get the majority of people to participate, you know, let's say in Meatless Monday, where um, people are not having meat on Mondays, that would be the equivalent of getting uh, a billion people to go vegetarian, which would be incredible because that's, I don't know, a reduction in like 15%, let's say. So you can imagine if we could reduce 70 billion animals by by 15%, I mean, you're talking about billions of animals that will be spared a lifetime of suffering. And yeah, there will still be billions more um, who are in those conditions. And if I could snap my fingers, I would happily make the world vegetarian or vegan, but that's not how it works, right? We have to do the best that we possibly can given the circumstances. And so, you know, if, if it's just one example, you could take the same metric around uh, carbon emissions. So 14.5% um, of greenhouse gas emissions come from industrial animal agriculture. So if we could reduce that by 10 or 20 or 50%, um, that would help. I mean, that would really help in terms of trying to um, mitigate some of the, the climate crises that we're facing. Every single metric that you can imagine around industrial animal agriculture, if we could lessen those impacts, uh, that would make a, a, a huge difference. And really the goal is to try to make the biggest difference possible, right? And this is kind of, I think, a cornerstone of vegetarian. Like you too and others listening might have I idyllic visions of what they want the food system to be. And to the best of our extent, we should try to pursue those. Um, but the goal is to try to, from my perspective, to make um, this issue as good as possible, as fast as possible. And I believe that encouraging people to cut back on animal products um, is probably going to um, do quite a lot of good, whether you're talking about animal issues or the climate or land use or water. I would love for my parents to eat five servings of vegetables a day. That would be great. Um, but you know, if I could get them to have three servings of vegetables a week, that would be a start. That would be something to celebrate. So. How does that translate? It might lower their risk of heart disease by, you know, a percentage or two. Um, it might, um, you know, decrease the risk of, I don't know, certain types of cancers by a percentage or two. So, you know, we know that in general, um, eating less meat, eating more plant-based foods across all these issues is going to have um, some positive effect on the world around us. And I'm glad you shared that kind of idea of just like, it's, a start and a step in the right direction. I think right now in life, especially as young people, I find that there's like so much going on and you're like, where do I even begin? So I think it's kind of, if you can kind of conceptualize and like, okay, this is like one step in the right direction or one thing I can do. I feel like it makes it less daunting um, to kind of look at this world and all these problems and kind of being able to just kind of slim it down and be like, okay, I can do this today to kind of help this impact. So I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, and you know, some people, they do start by just cutting back on participating in Meatless Monday, but then they realize it's actually like pretty enjoyable and they're happy to live a life that's in line with their values. And so they actually kind of approach being a vegetarian or they even might approach being a vegan. And so to your point, you know, this is just the first message, the first introduction that someone will have to this. And um, what happens after that is, is unknown. Um, it's very possible that encouraging people to eat less meat would result in there being more vegans, more vegetarians. But at the end of the day, we have to start somewhere. And I think this is a good place to start. In the Bay Area, we've seen a lot of food innovators lean into these ideas of plant-based alternatives, and in some cases, the emergence of lab-grown proteins. What do you see for the future in these two cases um, as an alternative to animal products? And just in general, what are your thoughts about plant-based proteins and the emergence of lab-grown proteins? Great question. You know. If we think about the, let's think about the problem, right? Just, so we have a problem in that 
people like eating meat, a lot of meat, the vast majority of people, particularly in high income countries like the United States. So 2021, Americans ate the most amount of meat in recorded history, something like 226 pounds of meat. In 2020, it was 225 pounds of meat. So it's an increase slightly. So at the same time, we know that most people choose food based on price, taste, and convenience. Um, we talk about health, we talk about environmental issues, we talk about animal rights, but at the end of the day, most people choose food based on price, taste, and convenience. And so once you accept that premise that people are choosing food based on those factors, it raises the question, well, can we provide people an alternative that is delicious, that is affordable, and is relatively convenient, but doesn't have the downsides that conventional meat has in terms of environmental issues, health, animal welfare. And so what this has, has led to is a kind of technological revolution where people are trying to recreate animal-based meat using whether plants or using something called cellular agriculture. Sometimes this is referred to, to lab grown. Um, um, it's lab grown in the sense that it's prototyped in a lab, um, but the way it works is that you would take a cell from an animal and you would put that cell in a nutrient dense environment. Those cells would multiply much like they would in the muscle of an animal, um, except you're growing that outside the muscle of an animal. And, and through that process, you have ground meat essentially. And if you, um, with other technological innovations, you could actually try to create a kind of structure to that ground meat um, that might resemble a whole cut um, of meat. Um, and then on the plant-based side, so not thinking about cellular agriculture, but thinking about something called plant-based meat, probably people know Beyond Meat, Impossible Foods, and so on. Essentially, you're taking plant-based ingredients from nature, you're creating uh, lots of pressure, lots of heat, kind of manipulating those ingredients, um, adding different ingredients, and you're getting the you know, texture, the taste um, of animal-based meat, but by using plants. So those are the two categories that you brought up. And that's why they exist, because we're trying to compete with animal-based meat on those metrics, right? Price, taste, convenience. Um, now, the problem is that no solution is perfect. So if you take plant-based meat, plant-based meat's pretty good. Some of the brands, right? They, um, they taste like animal-based meat to an extent, right? They're not perfect. I don't think most people have, um, I think most people can tell, you know, whether they're eating an animal-based meat or plant-based meat. Um, it creates a, a, a good sensory experience. You can go to, you know, um, Carl's Jr. and you can get a Beyond Burger uh, and, you know, you feel like you're having that and it, it does taste good for sure. But for some people, you know, they really want the real stuff. They want animal-based meat, right? And that brings in this idea of, of what you call lab-grown meat, or you could call it the cultivated meat or cell-cultured meat, in part because it's prototyped in a lab, but at scale, it's, it's not, it's not um, produced in the lab. Um, the problem with that is it's very expensive, right? So I just had cell-cultured seafood for the first time, um, which was really interesting. And I believe the price was roughly $500 per pound which if you've had salmon recently, you know that farm salmon is like $10 a pound. Um, wild caught is something like 20 to $30 a pound, depending on the species. So, you know, farm wild versus, you know, cell-based, there's a major discrepancy in the amount of, of how much this is gonna cost. There's one third one that you didn't mention, but I'll mention is this idea of regenerative agriculture or high welfare meat. So 99% of meat in the United States comes from factory farms. But if you can find a farmer that's engaging in extremely high, high, you know, high welfare practices where the animals are given a good life, where they're managing the land in such a way where it's either sustainable or maybe even regenerative, meaning it's sequestering carbon, allowing for healthy soil and so on, that's certainly an option. But similarly, lots of problems with that. It's expensive, it's, hard to, it's very hard to find. So why do I say all this? There's no perfect solution. That's the answer, right? You have all, you know that we know that factory farming sucks. That's not the academic word, but it's just true to my heart. It sucks. It's like the worst system possibly designed in terms of all of these issues. 
Um, and you have at least three better options, plant-based meat, cell cultured meat, and high welfare animal-based meat. And um, we have to create systems, of course, where we bring down those prices, where we make it convenient. Um, but it's an open question around to what extent that we're going to be able to do that. But I support all three. Uh, I think it's very exciting that these options exist. I hope there are more uh, people working in this space, more dollars are poured into it. Um, and at the same time, we have to have humility that we don't know what's going to work. But in terms of a market-based solution, um, this is definitely these three, I think, are some of the most exciting ones. And I, I encourage everyone to support all three. I think that kind of covers a lot of what you talk about in the documentary and we're kind of shifting over to talking about specifically your documentary right now. Um, I think you kind of hit that perfectly. Like it's about the steps you take. And like Brian said, like if it is Thanksgiving when you're with a bunch of people who maybe do eat meat and if you do or don't, it is kind of catering sometimes to like that greater audience and not being perfect 100% of the time, but like making that progress to kind of bettering in the way that you can. Um, and kind of transitioning into your documentary, we both have watched it. We both loved it. We found it super impactful and honestly really reasonable for an audience. I'm a vegetarian. Brian, I think now considers himself a reducitarian after watching. Um, so I think obviously we come from a bit of a different lens, but I think even if you are someone who eats meat, I think it's very reasonable and digestible kind of um, to understand. So we were just wondering what inspired you to kind of venture into the documentary filmmaking space with Meet Me Halfway. Thanks. I really appreciate those kind words. And I love, I love Meet Me, Meet Me Halfway. I'm really proud of it. It was a labor of love. It took five years to make. Um, and through that process, I was, I was learning a lot. You know, a lot of the moments that you see in the film are, are quite genuine. I never visited a high welfare farm, for example, and, and you saw me visit um, Will Harris at, at White Oak Pastures. Um, on, it relates honestly to the comment that Brian made earlier. Uh, books are very powerful and so are documentaries. They're a, a very useful tool for getting people to understand this complex issue in a digestible way. And I thought that there really weren't, there wasn't a great film out there that spoke to this kind of reducitarian value. I mean, there are, are great vegan films, right? Cowspiracy, What the Health, even Game Changers, so on. Um, but, you know, again, a lot of people I know don't want to go vegan or vegetarian, even if they intellectually agree with the premise, they're just not going to make that change. And I want there to be at least an option that's not selling that all or nothing kind of premise. And so, yeah, we set out to um, just create a documentary. And really, we were asking two questions. Um, why is it so difficult to get people to eat less meat, which is really the first half of the film, just looking at everything from our, our evolutionary history to the meat industry and their marketing um, to some of these questions you know, around price and, and taste and convenience um, and so on. And then really accepting that premise that people are going to continue to eat meat um, and transitioning to, well, if, if people are gonna eat meat, what can we give them that's not from a factory farm? And that's where we land on those three pillars, right? The plant-based meat, the cell cultured meat, and the regenerative um, high welfare um, meet. And so it was an amazing experience meeting all these different people, challenging my own kind of assumptions, um, deepening my compassion, even for people that I was coming up, you know, into heads with, like, like many vegans, um, or like, you know, my imagined like farmers who were growing animals like Will. Um, and I, I did come away, not surprisingly, perhaps, really realizing that there is no perfect solution. Nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody knows exactly what's going to end factory farming. But, you know, I do think that, that kale is not enough. Carrots are not enough. Like if you, you saw my parents in the film, right? And I think they're kind of the, the, the stereotype of what we're up against. My parents are just regular people who, you know, eat over 200 pounds of meat a year. They don't want to eat you know, for example, guacamole um, as all the time. Um, and so I, I don't know what it's going to be, but I think we all need to support those, those options. And of course, we should try to get people to eat more kale and carrots too along the way. But it, it, at least in the short term, we're going to need some compelling options. Um, and so, yeah, that was, the, that was what inspired me to make it and kind of what the, what the film is about. And I think what a major takeaway of the film is. 
also, were there any surprises that you guys came up uh, along the way? Yeah, I learned a lot. Um, I'm really glad that it took a long time to film because our idea for the original film was very simplistic. It was kind of like, let's take a person who's eating a lot of meat and get them to eat less and like show them at the doctor's office and they lost all this weight. And it just would have been more simple. Whereas one of the, I think, um, compliments that we get a lot in the film is that as, you know, as, as it was just said, that it's realistic, it's reasonable, it's nuanced. It doesn't even sell one particular kind of message. It's self-critical. You show people who don't like reduced vegetarian. It's up to people who watch the film to decide for themselves. The one point that we make is that factory farming is terrible. Factory farming exists because we eat so much meat. And if we want to end factory farming, whether or not you support kale or plant-based meat or cell culture meat or high welfare meat, we have to eat less meat in order to end the most, one of the most destructive um, practices in, in human history. I learned a lot from the vegan activists. There, uh, for those who haven't seen the film, there's a, a group of activists who, um, essentially they protest me. So I'm, sp I'm speaking at an animal rights conference about encouraging people to eat less meat as a tool for change. And they're um, arguing that, you know, that's inappropriate, that's co-opting the movement. Um, and so I spoke with um, a, a woman named Anita, who it, she had not protested me, but she's part of the philosophy that we should really only argue for veganism. And I really appreciated my dialogue with her and then her um, invite to um, watch pigs be sent to slaughter, which is a sad, a sad moment in the film, of course. Um, and that really deepened my understanding for why people don't like reduced vegetarian in some, some people, a small percentage in the vegan movement, um, because it's not enough, uh, not enough for them. Um, I learned a lot from Will, that farmer. I love the idea that you know, he says, I'm a, I'm a second amendment guy with a gay daughter um, who you better not F with. It's one of the quotes from the film. And uh, he's so charming and he's, you can't, he's, you know, you can't put him in a box because he has these very sophisticated views um, and was doing something incredible in that he managed to change his farm from one that was engaging in industrialized sort of factory farming practices. And now it, it really, really high welfare, um, you know, um, uh, and also practicing, uh, you know, engaging with the land in a way that's very environmentally friendly. So, you know, he, he made me more open to the idea of, okay, like maybe the slaughtering part sucks, but maybe this should be an option for people because if they're unwilling to eat anything else, you know, at least they're going to be eating meat that came not from a factory farm. Something that kind of encompasses a lot about what you just said is like, like the whole documentary really just created space for all sorts of things to kind of exist together, showing different perspectives on different sides. And like you said, not making one final overarching kind of this is what you should believe or this is what you need to believe, but kind of presenting everything that's out there and these different complexities and complex people with real lives. And a lot of things, honestly, a lot of people aren't exposed to, but just kind of highlighting those and showing kind of the different sides to that. I think you did a wonderful job at just acknowledging like, this is all that's out there. This is what's going on. There's probably more too, but like given these kind of different different experiences, we can create space for all of them to exist together and kind of go forward with how we want to kind of live our lives based on that. So I think you did a really great job at doing that. And I think like tolerance is kind of the word I feel like it comes to mind, just being tolerant and understanding of kind of everyone's different backgrounds and perspectives. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think that is a, that is a good word. And um, everyone agrees factory farming is terrible. It's like, you know, we could, we could all argue about our idyllic version of the food system, but it, it's very rare that a lot of people from different sides agree on something. And so just from a very pragmatic standpoint, um, we should, as you said, you know, tolerate and, and even just really understand that where people are coming from. Like, I don't know, I'm, I didn't grow up where Will grew up. I didn't grow up in that environment. I don't know who I would be if I grew, you know, in that place in that time. I can't, how can I judge? Um, and I love my parents and, you know, my mom, you know, my parents say, right, like we thought pizza was healthy, you know, when I asked who, who said that and they were like, you know, doctors and nutritionists and there was a lot of confusion. And so it's hard because you are, people get angry at what they see around them. But I do think that even the people we disagree with, even the people we want to change, we should try to have compassion 
or where they're coming from. It doesn't mean that we um, accept. It's just it's just the mental attitude of, of you know, I, I understand where these people are coming from. I understand how they became who they are. And now I'm going to try to create a world where there are no more of those kinds of uh, kinds of people if, if you know or maybe not maybe like it's fine because we all agree factory farming sucks and let's just focus on that for now so but yeah I appreciate I appreciate your kind words about the film yeah, and I think that's just a really inspiring kind of takeaway all that you just said right there um and inspiring kind of shifting over and we talked about this a little bit throughout but we talked about how books are so important and where we get a lot of our information from and I am sitting here with a very important book um, and I'm also looking at the back and I'm seeing an iconic comment from Jane Goodall. And I just kind of wanted to hear what you had to say about what that was like, kind of getting her endorsement for your work. It's pretty incredible. It's super surreal. I mean, it's, it's, that's the thing. It's, it's, there's a lot of agreement that we don't like factory farms. And there's also a lot of understanding how important it is. Um, it feels super surreal to me that someone as amazing as, um, Jane Goodall would offer those kind words. And she also re recorded a, a video for us that we showed at the Reducitarian Summit um, to, you know, to inspire everyone that was there. So I'm very um, honored um, by her support. I'm um, and thrilled that she's a part of the movement. Books are powerful. There was a lot of content in the film that we didn't get to include. Um, you go out and you film hundreds of hours of stuff and then you kind of cut it down to you know, know, two hours and then you cut away 30 more minutes and it's painful because there's so much you want to include. And so I was really happy to have the book because the book contains a lot of content that I didn't get to include in the film. I also wrote the, the book over essentially over those five years. So while we were filming, I was kind of writing at the same time and of course doing research. Um, and so there's just a lot of content that made it into the book that was not in the film. And so I'm really happy uh, that it's out there. And I think it's a, much like the film, I think the book is a good introduction for folks who are, want to understand uh, what's up with our, you know, with our food system in the context of meat and kind of what we um, can do about it. Um, yeah, that's my feeling on Meet Me Halfway. And I'm really grateful for, for all the support that we've had from people like, uh, like Jane Goodall. Definitely, definitely. And we appreciate you for taking time out of your day to speak with us and kind of give us the breakdown of past five years and the culmination of all of that to this point right now. And so go, moving forward, looking forward, what do the next two years look like? What's next up on your plate? That's a really good question. Um, there's, two, there's a couple of different ways to answer this. The first is that I'm taking a break right now. You know, I've, I've really worked... Um, really hard um, like the past eight years since founding Reducitarian. And this is feels to me like the first time in a long time that I've had kind of a clean break where I've, you know, the, the conference happened, the book came out, the documentary happened. So I've been using the past couple of weeks to just rejuvenate. And I share this because a lot of people who are advocates or activists kind of burn out um, and I don't want that. And so um, I want people to, you know, work really, really hard um, and to try to make the world a better place. But even if it's purely strategic to, to continue to be an activist, try to find space to take a break and be with people you love and, um, or you know, be with yourself um, if, you, if you're an introvert and enjoy that, um, whatever it is. Um, so that's, that's number one right now. Um, on top of that, we've just started a new fellowship program, which I'm really excited about. So we're gonna be working with 15 undergraduate students beginning in New York City. And we're going to be providing them with a year of mentorship, um, a year of seminars, and that will culminate in an internship where they will get placed at one of the partner organizations in the Reducitarian movement. And really the idea there is very similar to why we do the Reducitarian Summit, which is an annual conference that we have that moves from city to city, encourage people to attend. Um, I want there to be more people like us in the world who are in a position to do a lot of good. And we're really focused on students that otherwise might not have the same you know, level of access to opportunities. And so trying to create that with that counterfactual impact, otherwise that impact that wouldn't be created if, if we didn't have this, this fellowship. So I'm really excited about that. And I hope it's the beginning of a much larger program where we have fellowships all around the country. We're gonna start working on our next Reducitarian Summit 
um, which will be in, in another city sometime very likely in the, in the fall in, in 2023. I've been noodling around different, different potential documentaries and, and books. And so it's possible once I'm out of my vacation, my mental vacation, um, that will focus on producing and, and creating more um, content like that. Um, and so those are just some of the, some of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about. But you know, Reduced Terrain Foundation and the Reduced Terrain Movement is composed of literally hundreds of organizations, you know, thousands of people that are all using different skills, different tools, right? Whether we talked about market-based solutions, but there's policy, um, there's legal strategies, um, there's you know trying to get really rich and invest in companies or donate that money, um, working at VCs or food companies. So to anyone listening who wants to be a part of the movement, it's just, there's a lot of organizations, there's a lot of different ways to contribute and it's about figuring out what excites you the most and what you're good at and trying to, to find a place or create a place where you can put those two things into practice. So yeah, that's kind of what's up with, uh, with us and with the movement at large. Well, Brian, I would say that Cameron and I both coming from backgrounds, Cameron doing a fellowship here at Santa Clara and me working here at the Food Innovation Center, uh, we really appreciate the fellowship work that you're doing for students because based on our own experiences, it's been extremely, um, I've been extremely proud of what I've been able to accomplish through the help and mentorship of the people at our university. I'm sure Cameron can say the same. And so I love, absolutely adore that step in the Reducitarian Foundation's um, path. And uh, I really appreciate you guys doing that for young entrepreneurs and young students who are trying to break into this industry. That's so nice. Yes, if we can, you know, you, you two are examples of what's possible. So hopefully we'll, we'll have a lot more Brian's and Cameron's in the world through, through our fellowship. And um, I appreciate you saying all that. Yeah, and I think kind of to Brian's point and also to your point, like there are so many students who are interested in this whole space at large and trying to navigate kind of where to fit into that or what opportunities are out there, like definitely is a challenge, I would say, lucky to go to a school that has those opportunities right here. But like Brian said, I think it's pretty incredible that you're doing that. And also just kind of as we go into our last question, um, this is a big one, but just what generally or specifically advice do you have for students who really do care about these issues and really want to make this impact? Um, and whether that's today, one thing, or down the future, something bigger, whatever it may be, what advice do you have? Or maybe what advice did you get when you were kind of navigating this, this, this world we live in? Yeah, that is a really, it's, it's a tough question because it depends a lot on the, on the person and so on. But look, you know, at the end of the day, you want to understand the issues. So you want to try to read and get and watch documentaries and get knowledgeable and so on. And then once you are, I mean, once you have a basic understanding of this movement or other movements, then you want to figure out where you can contribute. And I think that this, this maybe is a, a cornerstone of my advice is that it really comes down to skills, right? So a lot of young people, they spend a lot of time up here and kind of thinking about an issue and that is important. And that's why I mentioned it. But after that, what matters is what can you do? Like, what can you actually contribute? So are you, are you interested in communications and you're you know, good at taking complex ideas and turning them into simple ones? Do you like to write? Um, you know, do you think you would be uh, really good at designing websites? Um, you know, maybe you're gonna be the person that designs all the websites in the movement. Or um, maybe you are, love science and you'd be a great biochemist. And so you wanna get a PhD and you wanna uh, try to create you know, the newest um, possible product. Maybe you want to work for one of these companies, um, but you don't always have to do what other people are doing, right? And so I wish when I was younger, I was told, um, you don't have to work for anyone. You can create your own thing. Like, why don't you go out and try to create your own plant-based meat company or cell culture meat company? Or um, why don't you try to become a lawyer and like work your way to create your own law practice uh, and then sue the hell out of you know factory farm um, companies? Um, of course, along the way, it helps if you have internships and you're, if you experience what it's like, like to be in those worlds with a focus on skills, because that's what it comes down to, right? Um, I have friends, I'm so happy that you two are graduating. Um, I have friends who didn't go to college, who are doing incredible things, 
um, journey. My, my co-director, he was homeschooled most of his life, very unconventional, super smart guy, very talented, picked up cameras, is an incredible documentarian. So, you know, I want, I'd, I'd be thrilled if people go to school and go to college and whatever they want. But along the way, you know, you could just go to Google and search like how to do something in a course and learn a new skill and, and so on. So um, I talk a lot about agency that we're very, I don't know your life stories and I don't know the people watching, but I imagine some people live in a re are relatively privileged. They, you know, manage, they have some power in the world, right? I mean, we're in a world where a lot of people don't have that power. And if you are a person who is relatively powerful, you can, you can do anything. You can do things. You can start nonprofits, start companies, and work work your way to where you want to be. And so, really, um, celebrate that agency. Um, know that there are a lot of people out there that want to help. I'm Brian at Reducetarian.org. I'm an email away. There are a lot of people that are an email away that are happy to support and give advice and make connections. We really appreciate you kind of breaking that down for us right there. We've also really enjoyed spending time with you today and appreciate the insights that you've shared. Um, you can find more information about the Reducetarian Foundation on their website, reducetarian.org, as Brian mentioned. And if you're interested in watching his documentary, Meet Me Halfway, it is available through Apple TV, Amazon Prime, Google Play, and YouTube. We hope you've enjoyed today's session. We're sad to see it come to an end, um, but we will post the links to the Reducetarian Foundation website and social media platforms at the end of the session, also, if you'd like to watch more, join us at the table. We will post the link to their RCFA website as well. So thank you all so much for listening. And thank you again, Brian, for being here with us. Great job, you two. And thank you, everyone. I appreciate it.